And now to our final, but certainly not least, speaker. Uh, particularly looking forward to this discussion because I haven't had the opportunity to say good morning to Josephine. Good morning. Um, we are going to hear from Josephine Goob, is that right? Uh, CEO of TechFugees. Now, in my conversation in setting up this uh, presentation with Josephine, uh, I think I, I could have spent at least an hour chatting about really what I heard was a great challenge to the energy industry, but also to industries wider. And the challenge being, and I won't kind of spoil the talk, because I think it's really important to hear from Josephine how she sees this. How can the industry do the right thing? And what is that right thing? So let's hear from Josephine now. Please welcome Josephine Goop to the stage. Thank you. Thank you Hi. Um, yeah. So my name is Josephine Azam, CEO of TechFugees, and what I'm about to talk about today is innovation in the humanitarian field, in this social field. Um, <clears throat> because it's interesting that innovation is talked a lot in the private sector, and it's less perceived as something worthy or uh, something to do related to refugees. How many times have you heard of innovation linked to refugees? I think not much. Uh, and yet, this is where it's most needed, I believe. This is where you can see the most impact, and this is where there's actually a lot of potential. But where is that coming from, what I'm saying? It's coming from 2015, when we saw a difference. When before, you'd see a refugee, they'd come, they need shelter, they need food, they need water. In 2015, we saw people on the shore, like this, saying, where am I? And where is Wi-Fi? And it shocked a lot of people that um, refugees perceived that poor, dirty, and whatever you want, perceived perceptions, um, would have smartphones as if they're rich. But if you're fleeing away war or environmental disasters, the first thing you're going to do is take your phone, most probably. Um, and they took their phone just because they wanted to connect with their families, find information, and really find help. So we have a change here happening, a disruption. We've heard a lot of this word the last 24 hours. And here are the numbers. Uh, I. <laughs> All right, so we have 50% of refugees that are under 18 and that will grow up in an increasingly digital world. We also have 87% of refugees that are, connect that are in an area of 2G and 3G. Um, so they have the possibility of accessing the internet. And then we have 95% of Syrian refugees that arrived in Greece that had mobile phone smartphones. Um, so based on this fact, and when, what we saw in 2015, we decided to make a call on Facebook. In London, I was working in a startup um, on immigration, actually, and we decided to just post on there, can we call up all engineers to help us and find up solutions to reach out and to build tech solutions to provide shelter, to provide health, to provide education, to provide the things that refugees might need. It just started as a simple call. And it just became viral. We got people all over the world in 25 countries in less than six months that started organizing hackathons. Hackathons, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. It's a, it's a cheap and uh, fast way of getting a marathon of engineers, of people that have coding skills and have ideas on how to innovate and be creative around an issue to come up with solutions, technical solutions. So here you have photos of different spots where they started gathering and thinking, what can we do for uh, building solutions? It grew, it grew. As I told you, in, 20, in six months, we got into 25 countries. Um, it grew more professional. People were just more organized. They came with their own servers. Um, they came from hackathons to hackathon. People in the New York hackathon came to the one in Belgrade, uh, came to the one in Krakow or Australia. 
and organized in teams. And then what we saw is refugees actually uh, more and more asking us, can I create the hackathon and the next hackathon? And that was where we thought we hit success, when the refugees are actually organizing their own hackathons to solve their own problem. And that's what you don't, I think, hear enough, is that if you give them the tools, they'll find solutions to their own problem. And that's what we're trying to do here, is to give them the tools and empower them to find their own solution. Because through hackathons to hackathons and other hackathons, and this slide is the same, so I don't have, ah. Okay, I wanted to show you, um, does it work? No, all right, this is weird. Um, but basically, there was a picture here of one of our hackathons in Paris where it's the refugee that came on the first day didn't know how to code, didn't really understand what was happening, and then came a year later saying, we learned how to code, and now we're going to win, and they won. And there were seven refugees from different parts of Africa that came together to create a platform for refugees in Paris to get information on where to access services. So again, they can create their own solutions if you give them the tools and if you empower them. So where we are today is, I told you, 25 countries, we have volunteers all over the world and ambassadors, and an online community of 18,000 techies that are thinking, how can we mobilize what we've created in the private sector world, what, the innovation that's happening for, in the Silicon Valley, for, uh, for in health, in other sectors, and how can we apply it to the situation of refugees in cities, refugees in camps, and refugees on the way. We got a hackathon in Oslo, it was two years ago. Um, and so I want to give you a bit of a picture of what came out. First thing, common. Have you heard of it? Okay. Right. Common is a platform where you can register if you want to welcome a refugee that has arrived in Norway, to welcome them to learn about the culture of Norway and have food with them, have a dinner. Um, this is an algorithm behind that matches people on preferences and what they want to talk about, what their background is, uh, common languages, stuff like this. And you receive a text and you're matched also on geographical locations. That's one. Second thing, TikTok. Have you heard of it? Uh, some, some. TikTok um, was done by a team that wanted to help all those refugees that have problem articulating their case at um, courts when they're trying to apply for the refugee status. I don't know if you're familiar with the law, but basically when you're a refugee, you can't get it like just showing up. You just have to show that you're actually threatened of death, that your government didn't want to protect you or didn't want to um, uh, didn't want to protect you or couldn't protect you from that threat of death. So they have a hard time explaining their case sometimes, and sometimes they don't have the good translator. Um, they also have, in daily life, difficulties uh, connecting to people. So what they created is a platform for people that speak different languages and want to help the refugees to actually, actually do the live translation. So as you can see here, you have uh, a refugee that is being matched with translator, certified, and can help the translation happen automatically. They have a business model around it, and we can talk about it after the session. Again, to my point is, there's a lot of innovation that's happening in the real world, or the world of every day, that could be applied to the situation of refugees or the needs of refugees, and this is what those guys did. So this is what we are about. TechFugees is about a technology and innovation that's the catalyst for inclusion. Because what we learn throughout doing this is there's a way to do technology that's, I wouldn't say good to be a moralist, but to be helping the people that are in most needs. And there's also a way of doing technology that can be really bad. And we saw a lot of these failures of when you're from the industry, I'm from the startup community, um, at first we didn't know about data or not enough. And we collected in a lot of data. And I saw in the hackathons, people collecting data on refugees. I said, what are you doing? <laughs> you can't collect data on religion, sex, and all of these things. The reason why they're fleeing away is because of their religious belief, because of their sex. Don't collect that information. Don't try to even make money out of this. Think of the new business model. And so we needed a lot of help to build tech refugees. We needed a lot of help from the tech sector and from people that had ethical minds to the tech sector. And we got lucky. We got lucky because a lot of companies from the Silicon Valley, from the tech uh, industry also in Europe, like Shipstead, supported us. 
But right now, we actually, and as CEO of TechFugees, I see that the challenge is actually much bigger than what we've tried to create. We won't go that far. We've helped 900 refugees over the two years, um, and 70% of them got access to internships and jobs through us. They got hired by the companies that are supporting us. Great, but 900 is nothing. 900 is nothing because today we have 68 million refugees. It's a growing number. It's been growing for the past three, four years now. And we're faced with the concept of climate refugees. And uh, it's not yet well accepted, but climate change is quite happening. And we have climate refugees. That is people fleeing away because there's no food anymore, no water or no houses because the house is on the thermofrost and the thermofrost is melting and so the house is actually just melting away. So to give, just to give you a few numbers and, and I'll give you the conservative one and I'll give you the high one. Conservative one is that in 2050, the World Bank predicts that we'll have 150 million ref climate refugees by then, 150 million. The other estimate is from the IOM, International Organization of Migration, and it's one billion. Between those two numbers, I don't know who's right, who's wrong, but we need to face it, is we're gonna have a lot of movement, and we need to prepare for it. If you thought that 2015 was a crisis, it was just a rehearsal, and it's an alarm. And yeah, I hope you understand that message because it's, it's really where we, we can play something, we can prepare. We need to invest for the future. But we can invest right now for the future because the future is actually now. One out of two refugees, I said, is under 18 years old. If we don't give them access to education right now, I don't know what kind of adults they'll become. And we can give them access to uh, iPads that they have educational content, and it's happening, but it's not happening at the scale and at the pace we need. So we need to act now. Um, the time spent in a camp is 17 years on average. That's an average. People are born, they die, they marry there. Um, here is uh, Zahtari, in, uh, it's in Jordan, it's in the north. I went there, um, and I think here you see the Champs Elysees of Zatari, they call it like this. They have a lot of shops, um, they have a lot of entrepreneurship actually. And uh, this, this, is city, this is working as a city, but it's close to the world. And we need to think of how to make this not this closed environment where people are trying to survive, but make it as a city where people can thrive. The other thing is, um, the largest camp is the size of Stavanger or Bergen. So to give you the size today of the largest camp, it's uh, 250,000 uh, people. It's in Kenya. But we expect more to happen, especially in Bangladesh after the flooding. Uh, so what I'm offering you here today and what I'm suggesting is we work together because the challenge is too big. It's too big for me. It's too, we had um, the chance to have partners from the beginning helping us from the tech industry, but we need bigger partners, we need more corporates to join us. And where we can work is those five areas. It's access to rights and information, health, education, employment, social inclusion. Today we have startups, we have technologies that help refugees, but they need to be scaled. And I need you in the corporate and the private world, because I don't expect anything from politicians today. And I think it was said by the CEO of Total yesterday. You have a lot of people that make speeches and they go, they are here to go. But you're here to stay. You have companies to run and you're not gone after five years. You're especially not gone in Iran with a refugee, if you've heard of uh, your uh, minister that uh, uh, <laughs> was extreme right and then went to Iran with a refugee. That was interesting. So I don't trust the politicians to help us on this. They're not investing in this at the moment. And you are the one in investing in innovation. So we need you. And yeah, I need you. <laughs> we won't go anywhere if we don't partner together on this. Um, that's all I wanted to say. The other thing is, um, I, I, I've heard a lot of, yes, I love the quote of Ramaz yesterday of Darwin. It's not about the strongest, it's not about the most intelligent, it's the one that most adapt to change. And I think it's extremely right. I've seen it from the refugees. They're going to be very successful for the ones I know. They are going to be role models for other refugees. They're one that are the most uh, amazing in their resilience. And there's no um, surprise that in the Silicon Valley you have 40% of the founders 
of companies, of innovative comp companies coming from migrant backgrounds. Not refugee backgrounds, but migrant backgrounds, and there's a difference with that. But that says a, a thing. It's people that are on the move and uh, able to adapt, can do something. So when I hear diversity and I hear gender, yes, but I love the word background because you need to employ on some of those guys. And if someone is recruiting, I have a lot of refugees, talented refugees in Norway, that have worked previously for some oil companies, actually, also, and also engineers. So there's plenty of ways you can connect with us on innovation. I hope you can join us uh, soon, <laughs> sooner than later. And really, I think for one last thing is the talent today, the most talented people I see around are joining us. Um, and uh, the talent is going to leave your companies if you don't address the big issues of tomorrow. This is where they go for working for Google and Facebook and other companies now. And so you'll need to be leading on those issues and you'll be leading with innovation. So um, thank you very much. And I hope uh, to speak with a lot of you after. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Josephine, for a very interesting talk. I know uh, there's probably we could talk quite a little yeah. bit about some of the um, the opportunities you're looking for in terms of investment and partnering. Um, but perhaps you could just crystallise in uh, one challenge you'd like to give to the energy industry in terms of what they could already do before they leave this conference on Thursday uh, to be able to do the right thing in working with So you've seen refugees. come in and TikTok. If you speak another language and you want to help a refugee, you can connect on TikTok. I know that they, are, they have 400 clients from uh, municipalities to hospitals today to help, and uh, they're also in refugee centers. But if you can get them to more places in the world where they need the translation service, or if you want to use that service and help a refugee, please go on it. Come in if you want to welcome refugees and learn from where they're from and how they're eager to learn Norwegian or to become Norwegian. That's the one thing I would say. And, and then, you know, I see a lot of things that look good, but please don't be fooled by think what, think what looks good. Just um, do things that work. And, and it will look good at the end of the day. People will talk about it. And make a difference. <laughs> make a difference. Yeah. Thank you very much to Joe Simgu.